curious to hear what the Federal Reserve and beer have in common? Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart here with a quick explainer video to show you the science behind why the Federal Reserve is practically guaranteed to fail at its efforts to gently bring inflation back under control. It's due to a phenomenon called the bullwhip effect, which I'll explain in just a moment. But first, a little context. Inflation, as anyone with eyeballs or a wallet can tell you these days, has zoomed to a 40-year high in response to the trillions in monetary and fiscal stimulus issued after COVID hit, as well as the related supply chain shortages. Having been a principal cause of it, the Federal Reserve long denied that its policies would trigger inflation. And once they did, the Fed assured us it wouldn't last long enough to worry about. Of course, as we've tracked closely on this program, things just went downhill from there. Fast forward to Thursday, as the January CPI number was announced at 7.5%, up from just 1.4% a year ago. The news headlines went into full fear mode and stocks and bonds started selling off. But then things got worse. St. Louis Federal Reserve President James Bullard spoke to the media, expressing such worry about inflation that he thinks the Fed needs to move faster and more aggressively with its rate hikes, potentially raising interest rates by a full 100 basis points by July. That really unsettled folks to hear. And then word started circulating that the Fed is having a rare emergency meeting outside of its normal schedule. Is the Fed so frightened that it thinks an immediate rate hike is necessary? It's all been chaos and confusion in the media since, as other Fed sources have been trying to calm things down a bit. But the messaging has been handled extremely poorly, so much so that seasoned Fed watchers are issuing critiques like this one from former Fed advisor Danielle DiMartino Booth. I don't think I've ever seen Fed communication so confused. After UMish this morning, it's clear that the Fed has never been as out of touch and insensitive to American households, which is also saying something. And this one from technical analyst Sven Henrik. Hey, Fed speakers, stop. Just stop talking. So as you can see, it's been a bit of a clown show which many of the experts I interview on this program have expected as they view the Fed not as some omnipotent, all-knowing entity, but a flawed and deeply fallible coterie of out-of-touch academics. While the Fed attempts to portray itself as the captain of the economy charting the course of events, in reality, its misguided policies create all sorts of misfortune, which the Fed is then in scramble mode to try to mop up. To help folks see this more clearly, I sent out this tweet the other day. When folks say the Fed is, quote, behind the curve or, quote, reactionary, its handling of interest rates is a case in point. One, stimulus won't be inflationary. Two, inflation will be transitory. Three, well, then they started tapering. Four, well, then they said they were going to hike rates later this year. Five, they're now calling for a 100 basis point of hikes by July. And to this, we must now add six, holding an emergency meeting to determine if immediate rate hike is necessary. In short, and this is the point of this video, the Fed is scrambling. It's not in control or in charge. It's just reacting to a system that has swung out of its control. Okay, now here's where the part about beer comes in. One of my more memorable moments in business school came during an operations class. The topic for the day was the bullwhip effect, a very real and vexing phenomenon that occurs in forecast-driven distribution systems. Essentially, when there are multiple parties in a distribution system, the imperfections in each player's forecasts, because no forecast is consistently perfect, they compound to wreak increasing havoc over time, even if demand stays relatively stable. Grasping how this works is somewhat non-intuitive. So the professor had us play a game developed by MIT back in the 1960s that uses beer to make the point, <laughs> and thus guaranteeing our full attention. The beer distribution game divided us into groups of four people each. Each person was assigned a role, factory, distributor, wholesaler, or retailer. Our task was to meet downstream demand while trying to avoid costly inventory overages or back orders. 
Now the game is played in rounds, and communication was limited to exchanging pieces of paper via which we either fulfilled downstream demand from our inventories, if we could, or we placed orders with our upstream supplier, and these were our forecasts. As the rounds progressed, the swings in inventory overages and outages became more frequent and more extreme. We each did our best to adjust, but that just seemed to make the volatility even worse. At the end of the exercise, I remember the professor asked a member of each group to go up to the front of the room and draw a chart of the demand curve their team saw during the game. Each team's chart looked wildly different from each other. All were chaotic and there were no discernible patterns among them. Then the professor dropped this surprise. He said, you all had the exact same demand from the market throughout the game. In fact, the level of market demand was constant for the first several rounds, increased once, and then stayed at that new level for the rest of the game. Now, despite a remarkably simple and stable demand structure, the system spun out of control relatively quickly with every team. Now, of course, that's the point of the exercise. Complexity breeds risk. Where there's uncertainty in a system, sort of like you know, when making forecasts about the future, there are both operational and behavioral foibles that must be tightly managed lest they compound to introduce real and non-intuitive instabilities. The takeaways from the exercise are, you must simplify processes wherever possible, optimize visibility and communications across the system and align incentives, and appreciate that even with all these precautions, you'll likely never have a perfect system. So remain vigilant for the emergence of bullwhip volatility in order to reset things before they get out of hand. All right, what does this have to do with the Federal Reserve? Well, the Federal Reserve also operates as a quote, forecast driven distribution channel. It makes forecasts about the health of the US economy and determines how much money should be in supply to best meet its goals for price stability, financial system health, and unemployment. With the lessons of the BOWIP effect fresh in your mind, you might be wondering, well, how simple is the system that the Federal Reserve uses to manage the money supply? Well, the Fed would like you to think that it's as simple as can be. Look at this easy to understand schematic. The Fed gives money to banks to then lend to people. Well, that's pretty darn straightforward, right? What could possibly go wrong? Oops, wait a minute. It turns out it's a little more complicated than that. If we dig a little deeper, we see that the U.S. Treasury plays a role in, quote, conduiting money into and out of the system, and that the Fed, via the FOMC, also interacts with corporations in addition to banks. Mm, okay, so there were a few more folks in the pool than we originally realized. Still, the players all fit nicely onto a single chart. It's probably all very tightly coordinated and finely controlled, right? <laughs> but wait. Each of those boxes in the above chart is actually a vast organization or collection of organizations. Well, let's look at each briefly. The Fed is actually a confederation of private banks headed by a board of governors composed of both banking executives and political appointees. Now, this is really not the most efficient or effective of combinations, of course. The U.S. Treasury has more than 100,000 employees. Of course, they all don't interface with the Fed, but multiple departments within the Treasury do. More than one third of all U.S. commercial banks are members of the Federal Reserve System. That's thousands of banks, folks. They're managed by the 12 Federal Reserve Banks, each of which has oversight of its district. Hmm. So the simple structure of the Fed providing banks with money actually encompasses the coordination of various departments within the Federal Reserve System, its thousands of member banks, and at least some part of the U.S. Treasury behemoth. Oh, and private corporations, too. In this context, the near-death experience that the financial system experienced in 2008 due to liquidity issues comes as little surprise. When things begin to get volatile, with this many parties involved, the BOWIP effect tells us that those responsible for forecasting are almost guaranteed to be wrong, especially when additional parties, such as Congress and the executive branch, get involved, as they did in crisis like we saw in 2008. It doesn't help that even during times of relative stability, the Fed's forecasts are poor at best, as this chart of how badly the Fed's GDP, GDP growth projections miss the mark every single year. 
As central banks around the world conduct the greatest monetary experiment in human history in real time around us, it's important to keep the bullwhip effect in mind. The mathematical odds that the world's many central planners, with their manifold partners in distributing fiat liquidity, are going to have the finesse to successfully steer their ships to safely through the shoals of inflation and deflation that threaten on either side, those odds are very low. And that's before taking into account the unintended consequences of their more extreme measures. Bottom line, if another liquidity crisis hits, which many of the experts I interview every week on this program worry is a real possibility in the future, the one thing we can count on is that the response from our leaders will be ill-fitting to the situation. Prepare accordingly. If you find value in explainer videos like this and would like to see more, Please support this channel by hitting the like button and then clicking the subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Thanks for doing that, and thanks for watching.